our house for a decade and a half that where, you know, the singing just reverberates in every cell of the house. And, you know, we went to other places and now we're here and it's kind of different. Not bad, just different. It takes me a little bit of getting used to it. I have some nervous that hives on my feet at 10 o'clock. Oh, no. That's a good thing, you know. You'd think a guy as experienced as Carl would never get nervous, but that's just not the case, is it, Carl? Worshiping God, brother. <laughs> it's a serious business, isn't it? Yeah. I have to keep reminding myself it's not about me, it's about God. I don't care what you're doing for the Lord. It's not about you, it's for, about God. So if he's willing to use me, hallelujah, I'm willing to be used. I, I'm not much, but what I am, I'm willing Praise the Lord. That was a good place to pass on amen. <laughs> we're we're yes, bro. visitors. Uh, my wife and myself, we want compliments. Praise team. Fantastic. Well, hallelujah. Thank you. I'm sure they appreciate that. We, we don't give them much thanks because we don't want their heads to swell. We'll, <laughs> we'll keep them humble around here. We don't pay them nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you 100%. I have, there, is, there is just not any better. I've been, I've been everywhere. <laughs> There's just not any better. Praise the Lord. We are so blessed. Glory to God. He's good. Hallelujah. I miss our brother Gino, but he's doing his thing. <laughs> yeah, he's spreading cheer. Praise the Lord. Father God, thank you for the prayers that went up. And thank you for the answer to the prayers. And thank you for your spirit. It isn't about us. It's about you. Grant us, Lord God, the, the spirit to communicate one to another. Open the hearts. And open my heart and my mind and my mouth and let me speak uh, what's on my heart. Not more, not less, but just what you had had me speak. And I already repent for, uh, for uh, being dust and just uh, saying things that I shouldn't and allowing some of the flesh to come through. God, uh, let it be evident and uh, let, let that that's palatable from you do its work in Yeshua's name. I got so many notes up here, I don't know where to go. I got Bibles. Praise the Lord. Have you, have you all got these? There's probably, oh, I don't know. I've fi when I'm finished, there's probably, I've got a lot of notes, but I, I, I didn't know if I was even going to continue this message this week, and I'm pretty sure I'm not going to next week, but. I reserve the right to change my mind again. Um, thank uh, Jeremiah for uh, going and getting these notes uh, from the printer for me. And uh, the notes that you have, I think there's 17 pages, and I, they don't quite run along with mine because in mine, and I probably should have in yours, it's just that I didn't want to give you a catalog. I, I, I got the scriptures, and I put all the scriptures in mine, whereas I just made reference to them in yours. And uh, the reason I did that or do that is because if I, if I quote a scripture there and then I say, let's go look, then it takes time for us to go look it up. So if you just bear with me, I know you get tired of hearing me, and it would be good to hear another voice here and there. But uh, for the sake of time, I'll probably quote scriptures Last week I talked to you and brought up the subject of the time of the Gentiles. All right, the time of the Gentiles. I know that sounds uh, eschatological, but uh, it's, this is not a study on eschatology. And uh, I laid down eschatology 20, 25 years ago. I just felt like uh, much of the, the understandings of prophecy was yet sealed up, and I didn't think there was a clear 
um, a clear message to be uh, for me to give, even though I discerned a lot from a lot of different people, a lot of good things. Uh, I, I just didn't teach about prophecy, mainly because I didn't feel like it was, uh, even though it has some ministry value, uh, I feel like people center up on it and it becomes an external or an intellectual, mental kind of exercise and always looking at newspapers trying to figure out where we're at and what's happening today and very little application of the Spirit of God to our own heart. So I haven't been teaching on it for many years and I'm not teaching on it now. Although I do believe that there are some uh, revelations that are, uh, that are available that weren't available that God's uh, beginning to bring out uh, for his purposes. And one of these bringing outs is, 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 is a understanding of where we are at in regard to the time of the Gentiles. Most of you know or heard of that heading, the time of the Gentiles. Well, I, I give you two uh, scriptures that quote uh, or make reference to that time of the Gentiles. Luke 21, 24. And Romans 11:25. And Luke 21:24 addresses one side of the time of the Gentiles, and then Romans addresses another side, or another type of the time of the Gentiles. And I don't know, I've never heard anybody make references to the two sides of the times of Gentiles, but it's all, not all that hard to see. It's not complicated. It's not an enigma. It's fairly well easily seen even in these two scriptures. So in Luke 21, 24 says, this is the Lord spoke, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, there's where we got uh, part of that times of the Gentiles was from that scripture. Romans 25 says it's something a little bit different where we can glean a little bit more out of it. And Paul writes, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this, Romans 20, 11, 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, unless you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel unto the fullness of of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. As I said, I don't think it's too difficult to discern that there's two types of times of Gentiles here. We have the times of Gentiles that Christ makes reference to as far as the Gentiles trotting down or pressing Israel and Jerusalem. And then we have this part that Paul's speaking of, the time of the Gentiles, that has to do with some calling out. Some time of the Gentiles meaning until the, the calling is completed. So you have those two types of the occupation or the time of the Gentiles that are running synonymous, uh, laterally together. Uh, they're... There are two things being fulfilled at the same time for the purposes of God. And it becomes important uh, to understand that because we have to find out where we're at. We're not trotting down Israel. We're not oppressing Israel. <laughs> well, hopefully we recognize Israel as what it is and who they are. And... Uh, so therefore, we're, we're, but we are a part of the time of the Gentiles, so what part are we becomes important. It becomes important for me, and I'll show you how. We Gentiles, then, are the subject of God's matter right now. It is that he has turned, he's turned from the, the nation of Israel as they have, if you want to look at your notes with me, uh, they have rejected Yeshua, the Christ, about 2,000 years ago. Israel as a nation was destroyed and its people dispersed throughout the other nations until 1948 when the nations arose again. 
when the nation arose again. The time dispensation we live in is the time of the Gentiles. And that time, God turns to the Gentiles to call out a bride. This bride or body was a mystery to the prophets and the people of Israel completely. It was a mystery. Today, with the returning of the chosen people and the establishing of the nation again, after nearly 2,000 years, it speaks loudly to those who can hear to the drawing close of the end of the time of the Gentiles. Both the time of the treading of Jerusalem under the feet and the calling of the mysterious bride out of them. I don't think it's too difficult to discern. You've probably heard it all your Christian life that we're in the last days. And, and I've heard it since 67. So um, it's closer today than it was when I first heard it. And, and so there's this... Uh, emphasis that I'm trying to put on, just not trying to overemphasize it, but this declaration or this resurrection out of the ashes of uh, the nation of Israel, it has to be uh, one of the most miraculous things that God has ever done. 2,000 years, and here they are again as a nation. So because of that, we should be extra alert to that time that Christ spoke of and Paul spoke of as the time of the end of the Gentiles. Now, I want to switch gears a little bit because we're going to talk about Gentiles and we're going to talk about the Jews and we're going to talk about Israel. And we're going to talk about the restoration, uh, the completion, restoration of Israel, the millennial reign. Uh, we're going to make reference to it, at least speak a little bit about it. And we're going to speak about this bride and we're going to speak about why the rejection of the Messiah and where he is and what is the Messiah doing and when can we expect him and what can we expect when he comes back and what are we and what part of Gentiles, a body, the bride, what are we and what are we doing and what will we be doing and how does this all work together uh, admittedly uh, I do not know everything about the millennium period, nor the end time. End time being that time that Daniel spoke of, the 70 weeks of Daniel. I, I know uh, considerable, have looked at it for many years, but yet I don't profess to have the, uh, the direct wisdom from God on it. I have read after other men, I have my own opinions that have developed through reading the Word of God, and I'd like to share a few of those with you. Uh, but obviously, if it, if it gets over here on this intellectual side, that's just a, a can of intellectual worms that we're going to open up. So, and that's not my intent or my purpose. My intent and my purpose is, is that we would glean out of this the wisdom of God, the understanding of God, the knowledge of God, the character of God, and we can see it fuller in the plan of God. So we can give him the reverence and the honor and the awe, and we can be good stewards as well. We can, we can be clearer in our own thinking, more defined and more uh, on point. Uh, w with me, everything has to do about the heart. So everything has to do about my heart. The, when, I, when I address the Word of God, and that's how I try to relay it to you. I'm not interested in learning for the sake of intellectual understanding or knowledge. I'm only interested in having the spirit of wisdom and understanding and the knowledge of God. That's all I care about. I don't care about being denominationalized. I don't care about being associated with anybody in the sense of uh, having some kind of covering. Or I just want to be a Christian, and I want to seek God with all my heart and understand the way he is. And you know what? He's just the kind of God that would show somebody like me the way he is. <laughs> huh? Right. If he takes the base things of the world and confounds the wise with him, I'm, I'm right there. I mean, the, he, he, he's got a good opportunity right here to fulfill his word. So I'm going to seek his face, and I'm going to try to reveal to you some of these things that some of you know, some of you don't. Some of you heard parts, 
pieces. And some of you have heard it enough that you're beginning to understand what I'm saying. Not so much in your lack of abilities to understand as my lack of to being able to teach you. And so when I bring up the next subject, right on the heels of talking about these Gentiles, I speak of covenant. Well, if <laughs> we certainly can't understand the scriptures. We can't understand the times. We can't understand Israel or the Gentiles or what's going to happen in the millennium. We can't understand anything if we don't understand covenant. God made a covenant. And you can just put it down, this entire uh, being and life as we know it, uh, is, uh, er, that we're experiencing, is about the salvation of God, the salvation plan of God, the eternal salvation plan of God. That's what we are all about, and the subjects that we're talking about it's all about. The times of the Gentiles, the Jews, Israel, millennium, the whole thing has to do with the salvation plan of God. The salvation plan of God is a big thing. But one thing you've got to understand about the salvation plan of God, it started with a covenant. He made a covenant with Abram. I mean, before that, he made a covenant with Adam. So the Adamic covenant is a covenant that I speak, I'm going to speak of when I speak of covenant. We're going to go back to Genesis. We're going to go back to origin. We're going to go back to the understanding that God has never, has never annulled his covenant. He's expanded. He's built upon. He's filled with meaning, but he's never said, well, that's done. I'm done with that and kick it to the side. <laughs> so when I speak of covenant, we go back to the Garden of Genesis, and that's all we know about as far as it, human beings are our concern. So covenant is important. Covenant was entered into for the promise of the future full reconciliation that was lost in the rebellion in the garden. Do you know about that? Pretty, feel pretty, pretty good about that? What happened there? We did need a reconciliation, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean we, uh, and hopefully I can bring it out even clearer uh, that you can, can get your uh, teeth into your spiritual teeth into it. There was an old covenant that was uh, filled with meaning in the manifestation of the Messiah. I'm talking about Jesus when he, in his first coming. And a new covenant power that would establish Israel as the nation among nations. When Christ put his feet down on the earth, uh, let's say when Christ was born of a virgin, and he was manifested to Israel, he carried with him the power of a new covenant, the power of a fulfilling of the old covenant, filling it full of meaning. He had that power with him. He would have established it. He could have established it uh, when he was on the earth, when he walked the earth, when he was in Israel. He brought a power with him, and the power was to establish Israel to establish Israel as the nation unto the nations. And that's what they were all looking for, a Messiah that would establish them as a nation unto the nations. They're still looking for a Messiah that will establish them as the nation. The nation that represents God, Yahweh, unto all the rest of the nations. Well, Christ came and Christ had that power with him. From the garden, God had established that there's no Remission of sins, covering of sins, atonement for sins without the shedding of blood. In the garden, a part of the Adamic covenant was that there were blood shed. The blood uh, was the covering for the remission of the sins for Adam. And God restored him into a partial fellowship, partial reconciliation, a partial remission, but not complete redemption. Okay? In Hebrews 9, 13, and 14, we find Paul contrasting covenant. And it's specifically inside the covenant distinctions, he, he brings out the covenants of the blood sacrifices. In Hebrews 9, 13, and 14, it says, the first purpose and the application of blood in the original covenant, he says, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. So here we find, without finishing that verse, here we find the purpose of that first covenant 
blood and it and it how it affects or affected Adam his being and God and his relationship do you get that out of there do you see how I come up with that for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer and you remember that it was a part of the mosaic uh, ritual sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh so in other words that ritual of blood animal innocent animal blood had an effect and it was for the purifying of the flesh according to Paul he's he's going to contrast here between the old covenant blood of the innocent animals and the new covenant blood of the Messiah and he says clearly uh, the per, part of the clearly the purpose was to cleanse and allow I'm, st I'm still speaking about the old covenant blood of the innocent animals Clearly, the purpose was to cleanse and allow the offer remission atonement for the flesh in order to draw nigh. Remember, that's, a, that's the meaning of the word sacrifice in Hebrew, to draw nigh. That position of his sin and sin nature being covered by the atonement blood in order to remain in some type of relationship and fellowship with God. Now, the second purpose or the second uh, blood atonement through which was the blood of Yeshua, that covenant with his blood had a further or deeper meaning. And Paul continues in verse 14 by saying, how much more shall the blood of Christ, how much more? In other words, how much more than what? If the blood of the innocent animals purified the flesh, how much more, you know, how much more efficacy, how much power, how many... How much more uh, ability, how much more ability was in uh, the blood of Christ? How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So we see the purpose in, this, in the second atonement blood, Christ's blood, which is purge your conscience. Well, whatever that means. Okay? Purge your conscience. And that's about like a two weeks study right there. Okay. So we're going to just skip over like you understand it, but we know it has meaning. Purge your conscience has more meaning than sanctifying or set apart or cleansing your flesh. There's more to it because Paul contrasts it. Okay. The blood of animals had purpose, although it was also type and shadow for the blood of Christ. But it had a purpose. That purpose being that that blood did sanctify or set apart the offerer's defilement of flesh and allow him to remain in a limited relationship and draw near to a holy God. What do you suppose would have happened to a Gentile had they walked into the tabernacle? Well, we, we, we have some examples of that. In other words, there, there's a procedure to uh, that God had required to approach him, to draw nigh to him. So if he drew nigh to him without this ritual or this covering, this, this atonement covenant that God had declared for the purpose of bringing about the salvation plan, which is the fullness of reconciliation, if you tried to circumvent that or go around it or do, it, it, do anything in any way, uh, that crossed that, uh, that at the very least, it was unsuccessful, at the very least. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, contrasts that blood of animals and its effectiveness with the much greater effectiveness of the blood of Christ in that it goes beyond the mere flesh, mere flesh sin covering unto sanctifying power. The deeper and more meaningful application with its greater purpose in God's plan. That is, to the cleansing and purging of the conscience or the mind of the soul. That is to say, a dealing with the sin nature. As opposed to just sin, dealing with sin, the remission of sins. Now we're going deeper and we have a, a considerably more effective and powerful blood that actually reaches beyond just remission of sins down to the sin nature. Thereby allowing a coming into a much more acceptable and a greater potential condition. That potential is, that potential, not 
not to mention that, that it's a eternal salvation, but from our perspective, from God's perspective, it's a, that he seeks those that would worship him in spirit and in truth. That's God's purpose in, in his creation. And so we are no exception. God says he speaks, he seeks those that will worship him in spirit and truth. This stems from a sanctified spirit and soul. Just a innocent blood animal covenant covering will not reach deep enough that God may have obtained in a man because the propitiation was not enough that he could receive from man a worship from spirit and in truth. Did you follow that long-winded sentence? So, so see, see the need, see the, see the covenant need, and see the covenant difference. Uh, this stems from a sanctified spirit and soul with the result being a yielded heart. In other words, if, if, if the purging is working, it's, it's affecting the conscience, which, is, which affects the heart. If the application of the blood is properly applied, then you can, then you can uh, see how that it would be used, being in conjunction with the application, you, your heart, your soul, your mind, would be being purged of not only sin, but the sin nature. So he's, he's a good doctor. He's went beyond the symptom. And when he's went down into the very cause, the core. Are you with me? <clears throat> this stems from a sanctified spirit and soul with the result being a yielded heart, taking dominion over the old nature, willingly serving God through Christ's enabling completed work. This is the promise of reconciliation in the old covenant. This type of reconciliation that goes beyond the innocent blood of animals, that atonement, it was in the Old Covenant. It was a promise that God made to the Israelites. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with the fathers in the day that I took them out of the hand, by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward part and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. That's quite a notch above wherever they were. And God recognized that he recognized their fallibility. He recognized uh, their need. And even if they didn't, he succinctly put it and declared, you know, I've made a covenant with you before. I've tried to be your husband. I led you out by the hand. He said, it didn't work out, but I'm going to tell you what I am going to do. And this is what I'm going to do. And he hung that out there for them. And it was their understanding and their belief that at some point God was going to reach into the very core and he was going to write upon their heart. Now, in the Hebrew, you know, this is English, right? English that came from the Greek. But in the Hebrew, it's inscribing as, as, as opposed to just writing. If you take a pencil and you just write, you know. Uh, it's more like, if you're going to write, it's more like with ink and very soft paper because it, it'll absorb and become a part of the bond of the paper with the ink. But it's, it what gives us even a better picture of what God was saying in the and the process of what, how to do this, writing on our hearts. It has to do with, with rock on rock. It has to do with a sharp instrument on a rock. Well, you take any instrument, sharp instrument, rock, and you, and you try to inscribe on it, it's going to take you a bit. It's not just going to, you've done it. You tried it on a tree with a knife. It's not all that easy. Sure, try it on an old stony, rocky heart. And what, what, we're, what God is saying is he is going to inscribe his nature it's not a law that you can look down and say, oh, this is thou shalt not. And, you know, and remind yourself, oh, that's what God meant. That's not inscribing on your heart. What, he, what it, is, it implies is that he's going to change our nature from the inside out. So it's an old covenant promise. 
to the, to the Jew. Had the Jew had that promise fulfilled to them, they would have been a light to the nations, would they not? Well, they would have been. They'd have, they'd have won. All the people in the whole world would have wondered. This, this particular scripture was fulfilled in Christ and made available to the Gentiles. And this is what has to do with the mystery. Hebrews 10, 14 through 17 talks about that. Christ Yeshua, the Messiah, came to fulfill this old covenant promise to Israel 2,000 years ago. And since Israel as a nation rejected that promise, God judged Israel severely and turned to the Gentiles with the promise. I'd love to be able to read it. Can I read it real fast? Romans 11. Just real fast. I'm just going to just blah, 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 blah. And you'll wonder, what, why did he bother reading it? Can't understand what he said. Chapter 11, I ask then, has God totally rejected and disowned his people? Of course not. Why well, I myself am an Israelite. I'm reading out the Amplified. Very rarely do I. But I like the way it reads in the Amplified. I myself am an Israelite, Paul said, the descendant of Abraham and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. No God has not rejected and disowned his people. He's not done that. There's no replacement theology here, by the way. No God has not rejected and disowned his people whose destiny has marked out and appointed and foreknown from the beginning. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how, how when he pled with God against Israel, the Lord said, they have killed your prophets. He has said, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time there is a remnant, this is Paul speaking, a small believing minority, selected, chosen by grace, by God's unmerited favor and graciousness. Uh, I, you know how I feel about that. I believe that word grace is misinterpreted there. It should be God's, it's the spirit of God, the divine spirit of God and the influence upon the heart. But if it is by grace, it is no longer conditional works or anything men have done. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. It would be meaningless. What then shall we conclude? Israel failed, failed to obtain what it sought, God's favor by obedience to the law. Only the elect, the chosen, obtained it, while the rest of them became callously indifferent, blinded, hardened, and made insensible to it. As it is written, God gave them a spirit, an attitude of stupor, eyes that should not see and ears that should not hear, that has continued down to this very day. And David said, let their table, their feasting, banqueting, become a snare and a trap, a pitfall, and a just retribution, rebounding on them like a boomerang. Let their eyes be darkened, dim, so that they cannot see, and make them bend their back, stooping beneath their burden forever. This is quite an imprecation. You know, calling down a curse is pretty, you know, it's not something I'd recommend you do. Uh, you know, you're walking on a real thin precipice when you start calling down an imprecation on individuals. It's not bad to call down an imprecation on God's enemy. I do that. I, I feel real comfortable calling a curse down on the enemy of God you know, in a general terms. But if you're, if you're speaking specifically to people, it's very, that's a very dangerous thing. But here we find Isaiah doing it, we find David doing it, and that's by the Spirit of God, wouldn't you say? It's an implication on the nation of Israel, a, a calling down. So I ask, have they stumbled so as to fall? Even recognizing that this implication had taken root in Israel, Paul still says, so I ask you, Gentiles, have they stumbled so as to fall to their utter spiritual ruin, irretrievable? By no means. But through their false step and transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to, arose, so as to arouse Israel to see and feel what they forfeited and so to make them jealous. Now, if their stumbling, their lapse, their transgression has so enriched the world at large, and if Israel's failure means such riches for the Gentiles, think what an enrichment and greater advantage will follow their full reinstatement. So I mean, you should be able to see here, you know, God turned his back on the Israel, Israelites, right? And he, he actually cursed them. He gave them a stupor, a spirit of stupor, darkness. They couldn't see, couldn't understand, couldn't figure this thing out. But he did it for a purpose, Paul said. He, he did it for a purpose, not because they didn't deserve it, but for the purpose that they did deserve it, he was able to do this for that he might pour out his mercy on the Gentiles. So here we have God's 
plan. <clears throat> but now I am, but he's also declaring that they're not fallen irretrievable, that God's going to reestablish them. So let's just establish the fact that Paul said that God's going to reestablish them. But now, I'm, but now I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles. Insomuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I lay great stress on my ministry and magnify my office in the hope of making my fellow Jews jealous in order to stir them up to imitate, copy, and appropriate, and thus managing to save some of them. For if their rejection and exclusion from the benefits of salvation were overruled for the reconciliation of a world to God, what will their acceptance and admission mean? It would be nothing short of life from the dead. Now, if the first handful of dough offered the first fruit to Abram, the patriarch, patriarchs is consecrated holy, so is the whole mass of the nation of Israel. And if the root, Abraham, is consecrated holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off while you, Gentiles, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among them to share the richness of the root and sap of the olive tree, do not boast over the branches and pride yourself at their expense. If you do boast and feel superior, remember it is not you that support the root, but the root that supports you. You will say then, branches were broken, pruned off, so that I might be grafted in. That is true. But they were broken, pruned off because of their unbelief, their lack of real faith. And you are established through faith because you do believe. So do not become proud and conceited, and rather stand in awe and be reverently afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches because of unbelief, neither will he spare you if you are guilty of the same offense. <laughs> what am I saying here? Do you understand what I'm saying? Are you getting this picture by the Spirit of God? I'm telling you that it's a miracle that God did, what he did to call this bride. That this time of the Gentiles that we live in is because he turned his back on the Jews so that he might show his mercy to the Gentiles. But he, Paul is saying, and it's by the Spirit of God, and it's prophetic. He said, but if you don't brag, don't boast, don't think anything great of that, or if you don't keep a fearful watch and attitude of heart, then God will do the same to you. And that's, that's what's happening today. There's a spirit, a stupor, blindness, darkness. They don't, this, it's a religious spirit that's come upon Christendom. Then note and appreciate the gracious kindness and the severity of God. And we can see both kindness and severity. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's gracious kindness to you provide you continue in his grace and abide in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off, pruned away. And even those others, the fallen branches, Jews, if they do not persist in clinging to their unbelief, will be grafted in. Does that sound a lot like the end days, end times, when they mourn, they see the hymn, they crucify? It, it, it's kind of like that. <laughs> they're, they're, if they change, and they're going to change. We're changing, they're going to change. And I'll explain more about that in a minute. For if you have been cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and again, against nature, graft into a cultivated olive tree, how much easier will it be to graft in the natural branches back to the original pat, parent stock of their own olive tree? Lest you be self-opinionated, wise in your own conceit, I do not want you to miss the hidden truth and mystery, brethren. A hardening, insensibility, has temporarily befallen a part of Israel to, to last until the full number of the ingathering of the Gentiles has come. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come to Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant, my agreement with them when I shall take away their sins. From the point of view of the gospel, good news. They, the Jews at present, are enemies of God, which is for your advantage and benefit. But from the point of view of God's choice of election, of divine selection, they are still the beloved, dear to him, for the sake of their forefathers. For God's gifts and his calls are irrevocable. He never withdraws them when once they're given, and he does not change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace, his, his divine influence, or to whom he sends his call. Just as you were once disobedient and rebellious toward God, but now have obtained his mercy through, his dis through their disobedience, so they also now are being disobedient when you are receiving mercy. And they, in turn, may one day, through the mercy you are enjoying, also receive mercy that they may share the mercy which has been shown to you through through you as messengers of the Gospels to them. It's a cycle, and it's a wisdom of God. It's the manifold wisdom of God. You can't miss this. I mean, if you're so uh, singular-minded, you know, so anal, all you can see is this one little part, you've got to see uh, the whole salvation plan of God. 
Oh, the depth and the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unfathomable, inscrutable, unsearchable are the judgments, his decisions. And how untraceable, mysterious, undiscoverable are his ways, his methods, his path. Who has known the mind of the Lord and who has understood his thoughts? For who has ever been his counselor? Or who has first given God anything that he might be paid back or that he could have? Claim a recompense for from him and through him and to him are all things for all things originate with him and come from him. All things live through him and all things created and center in him and tend to consume, consummate and to end in him. To him be glory forever. Amen. Amen. So, and thus, in a general description of the mystery of the calling of a, of a, out of a bride or a body from Gentiles, and this accomplished through extending the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll read that again. It's so important and so overlooked, but yet so obvious. This calling out of the Gentiles is accomplished through the extending of the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit to write God's character upon the heart was the promise that was given to the Jews in Jeremiah. And the way that they would have had the right the word inscribed the character on their heart was by following after the Messiah Yeshua. Well, when they rejected the Messiah Yeshua, and God turned the Gentiles to call a mysterious body out of, then it's the gift of the Holy Spirit after the atonement that is the way that God uses to inscribe the character of God, Christ, upon our hearts. So that inscribing is synonymous with the power, the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit. So, it's, so he's the one that's inscribed. And he wasn't before Christ atonement because the propitiation only would reach as deep as the uh, cleansing of the flesh. Are you with me? But in the atonement, the blood of Christ reached down to the conscious, whereas now... When we call upon that greater blood, we have a much greater power, the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that regenerated past, present, and future. That power is residing within us. Is, is, we draw upon that so that the Lord will inscribe across our heart the character of Christ. Change us progressively from one glory to another. Let me read it. I like Acts 1 and together with uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Acts 1 says, And speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Acts chapter 1. But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So this is something that wasn't available in the Old Covenant in practical application. But the promise was there. The promise was found in the Messiah, who was able, just that he did unto us and bring unto us the power of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit. He was able to blow it on the disciples. He was able to do miraculous things with them that had not been done before by the power of the Spirit. But after his crucifixion and his resurrection and his glorification and his anointing, that power that we can draw upon through the atonement blood of Christ is the power of the Holy Spirit that had not been before, for it had even not come into the depth, into the fullness that was available before Christ's death in that he breathed upon him, that in Acts chapter 1 he said, tarry and wait for the fulfilling of this gift that I promised you was coming from the Father. Again, it's a long-winded explanation, but you should... that. That's how you get the understanding is to go over it in your mind and to understand what, what's happening in a full conceptual, uh, you know, we hear about the pouring, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Okay, but what does that mean? Well, it came from covenant. It came from God's covenant, which he purposed to, for the salvation plan of man, both Jew and Gentile. And it came through the blood because God established from the garden it was going to be through blood. Are you following me? You have to have this understanding to really appreciate and to convey and not give place to the devil. The devil has all kinds of ways of spinning things to, to hurt your faith and cause you to have unbelief and shipwreck your faith. Well, that isn't so because blah, 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 blah. He's got a thousand things. 
So the more established we are in the Word of God, the more it's inscribed in our hearts, the more we understand of God, because the biggest lack that we have today is the understanding of the character of God. In the church today, that's the biggest misunderstanding, and it's because of the watering and the deluding and the lying of, and the Christian uh, lies of false prophets and uh, people that were uh, putting to, into positions that have st stolen the power of the gospel, away from the gospel. So, go wait, he said, and the Holy Spirit's coming not many days hence. And then it did come. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, we have, we, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Is that progressive or was that an event? It's from, what is from glory to glory and change from glory to glory? That, that, that's that's a, pro, a process, isn't it? Yeah. It's a process. <laughs> it's not an instantaneous event. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit, but it's not an instantaneous event. It's as we behold Christ, <laughs> as we continue to behold him. Praise the Lord, and we draw upon him because we behold him. We don't stare at a picture on a wall. <laughs> we look into the character, the, what he did, what he was, what he said. And by meditating and looking and thinking and praying and yielding, we find this glorious effect on us that God will bring about progressively through faithfulness. Well, it's not working with me. Well, that should tell you something. That should tell you something. Are you patiently waiting before the Lord? Are you observing? Are you, well, I tried that. <laughs> yeah. It won't work, people. Trying won't work. This is a lifelong commitment. It's a covenant, isn't it? Well, you know that. I'm going to preach it now instead of teaching. The promise still exists to the nation of Israel. This promise that I'm speaking to you, the Holy Spirit inscribing upon your heart, still, it still exists and it's still to the nation of Israel. Not only on an individual basis, but on a national level, as that was the promise. And, and his callings, we read, are sure and without repentance. God has never annul his promises. 11.29, Romans 11.29. They are to be head and not the tail. They are the head and not the tail, but they've mostly been the tail. But in the end, they're the head. A light unto the nations. And that is what the scripture foretells as a sure destiny for the nation of Israel in the scriptures. Amen. Amen. It's true. Might as well say amen. Not, <laughs> not oh me. It's amen. Just as the blood of animals had to be mixed with faith to have a sanctifying effect, didn't it? Yep. Or could you just come in there any old way and bring anything in there and just here's my cow and go away and be expected God to remit your sin? No, it had to be mixed with faith a sanctif to have a sanctifying power. Why? How is that so? God, look out. He knows. He knows. He knows. He knows our heart, every one of us. So does the new covenant blood of Christ needs to be mixed with faith in order to write the law upon the heart. That is the sanctifying of the flesh, that is to say the carnal body and soul. It can be achieved with the end results of its purpose. Let me just say it again if I haven't said it a million times. When God recreated your spirit and by the Holy Spirit, he could have changed your old filthy soul at the same time. But he left within you what he left in every man, carnality. He left in every man, every woman, every child, even every little children. Everybody has the nature of the fallen uh, uh, Adamic spirit. And it wasn't by accident God left it there. He didn't do just a halfway job. He didn't forget. That was his, by his plan. He's going to leave it in there, and he's going to make you deal with it. Just like he made the Israelites deal with Canaanites. He didn't go in and clear them out and then send his people in there just uh, hooping and hollering. They went in there, and they had to get bloody. That's the same exact thing I'm talking about right here. Purging the conscience has to do with you and I yielding, fighting, taking up the sword of the Spirit and prayer, and faithfulness, diligence. Casting down every high imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, against the covenant that he called us into. So 
This is the purging I'm talking about. Here's what the Holy Spirit said he would do. The end result of it, the purpose of it, is for purging out the carnality, the bringing of the soul into dominion through man's purged conscience. That is to say that the sanctified through his blood bought authority and the gift of the Spirit enable the believer to overcome by casting down and bringing into captivity every imagination that exalts itself against mind against God, a conscience against the dominion of God. Anything that comes up in you that, well, that takes dominion in, over anything that's God's is, needs to be cast down. For God's completeness, can you do it yourself? No. That's why I sent the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit. No, you can't do it yourself. But you can't lay down and say, oh, I just can't do it. You can't do that either. It's not apathy. It, it, you know, the kingdom of God is taken by force. You can't just, oh, I guess I'll just hold on to this guy's coat and follow him in. You're not going to make it. For God's completeness of the work and purpose, that of oneness. That's, his, that's God's plan. It wasn't my plan. I'd do it a lot easier. I would have changed my soul at the same time he recreated my spirit. I would not have went through this from if I was doing it. <laughs> That's a spiritual marriage, a brideship to Christ and sonship with God. But how many know without pain there's no gain? How many know you can't get a crown and you're not going to be uh, crowned and, uh, and, and, and given a name that no man knows except Christ? And how many know that you're not going to rule and reign with God? unless you overcome. I said, it's to the overcomers that he made the promise. He didn't make it, he didn't make it to, if you believe in Jesus. I'm sorry. Believing is not meritous enough. It's just not meritous enough. Well, it's not what my, well, read the Bible. I'm, I'm telling you the cold, hard facts. Believing is not meritous enough. It has to go beyond believing into knowing. And that's another two-day sermon anyway. The working person one is, that is spiritual marriage, brideship to Christ, sonship with God. That we might be built into the temple of God, inhabited living stones being built at the foundation of Christ. I'll tell you, I do digress just one second. Time's creeping away from me, but I just can't help it. I have some uh, very little glimpse of understanding here. And, uh, you know, and all I can say is, uh, the way it, is, it seems to me that God speaks over and over about us, about his body of Christ, about his, this temple that he's, that he's building, it has to do with light. And we're going to shine forth. You remember the scriptures, it has to do with shine forth, let the day dawn spring forth in your hearts. Well, the light is an issue, and the light with God is an issue. And this temple, this temple that needs no light in the millennial time, all right, Revelation chapter 21 comes down, this uh, we're being built into a temple of God, that, and we're light. We're going to have light. I mean, that clothing, the glorified body that God gives us, again, at least again, from what Adam had, that Shekinah glory of God, it is going to flood us, emanate from us. You see, you see, naked in the earth is without clothes, right? Naked in the spiritual realm is without God's glory see so when you die this I'll tell you a lot so when you die you're naked you're naked because you, you're still showing your shame the shame of, of, of what we did as men we rebelled against God we lost our glory but why did God put such importance on the body you know and he does doesn't he I mean even those people that have gone beyond now do not have their glorified bodies for they don't precede us, the Bible says. But we'll, they'll receive we'll be in their resurrection as we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye if we still be here. We'll change how? We'll be changed from corruptible to incorruptible to a glorified body as Christ has. How is every vision seen of Christ since his glorification? Just spectacular. My point is when we, when we leave here, if I leave here today, uh, we'll leave here naked in, on the earth, but I'll also leave, I'll be naked when I get on the other side. Naked in the sense of a covering. That's the kind of glory that I'm talking about. I'm talking to you about the resurrection of the body. Now, and I told you I was digressing, right? This has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. I'm just giving you food for thought here. 
when we re are resurrected, our bodies are resurrected, right? Our spirits, our souls are not resurrected. <laughs> it's our bodies, and our bodies are given this glorification, this Shekinah glory, and it's light. And we are a part of the temple, right? The temple is being built for God that he's going to dwell in. It's a, it's a temple of light. I won't go any further. A lot of you looking at me like a gate or a cow at a new gate. Yeah. I still don't back up. That we might be built into the temple of God inhabited, living stones being built upon the foundation of Christ. That's more than just what I'm trying to say. It's more than just poetic words. This finished work of Christ is not automatic or completed in the mere believer, but is appropriated through ongoing communion and cooperation through yieldedness. Commun and there's a hundred scriptures. Communion is synonymous with abiding and is required in the redemptive and reconciliatory work to affect God's complete atonement purposes upon man's being. Words with a lot of meaning right there. Note, this work, the work used or employed for the calling out of the bride from the Gentiles, although accomplished in a different way, will presumably be the same finished work accomplished in the millennium period. And I saw an angel, Revelations chapter 20, verse 1 through 6, and I saw an angel come down from the heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand, and he held on to the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. I speak only because of these scriptures for two reasons. One, because it mentions the millennium period, and that's a thousand years, and it says it specifically in the Bible. It's a thousand year period, and it also it says right here what he does with the devil during the millennium period, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither hath received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This has been understood by most theologians, expositors of the Bible, as the bride of Christ ruling and reigning with Christ during this thousand year period. We'll talk about it in a minute. But the rest of the dead live not. But the rest, that's kind of where I don't want to be. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. I'm, I, I, just to speak to that real quickly, I, I'm not of the a school of thought, after meditating much on what I'm getting ready to say. I'm not of the school of thought that all those that lay in the grave that are not a part, part of the first resurrection are all bound, doomed, judged to go to hell. Don't believe that. Yeah, I don't think there's scriptural evidence of that, although I, we know that it, it, the Bible says that blessed is he that is a part of the first resurrection. But Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On a such second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God. In other words, there is a second death, and it is a part of the second resurrection. Those that are resurrected again from the dead and then are condemned, that's two times, isn't it? That's the second death. But that doesn't mean that all that lay in the grave that thousand year period were those that were condemned to the second death. Are you with me on that? Do you understand what I'm saying? But they shall be priests of God and of Christ. Who? These, these that are a part of the first resurrection. They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Well, obviously, God's got a plan here. He's got a plan. There, the, 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 we know there's this millennial period, a thousand years, that God has set aside for a purpose. And we'll, we'll, we'll speak more to about the, those purposes here in a minute. Just trying to lay the groundwork here a little bit. Time about up. No. <laughs> it never fails. I, I'm still reviewing last week's lesson in case you're wondering where I'm at. When Paul says, For it is not possible the blood and bulls of goats should take away sins, Hebrews chapter 10, 
or for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. I'm quoting two scriptures that Paul makes reference to as how there's a transition. Hebrews, wake up. Here's what I'm telling you, Paul says. I'm telling you the blood of bulls and goats didn't have, couldn't take away sin. And I'm telling you that, that was, those things were all shadows of the real thing. In other words, he's talking to them. He's con convincing them. He's arguing with them about the transition between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Thus, it's called the book of Hebrews. He is not saying that the Old Covenant blood was purposeless or without effect and meritless, nor was it merely a type of shadow. He's pointing out that even mixed with faith, they were never going to accomplish God's created greater covenant work. Why? Chapter 8 of Hebrews tells us. He said, Paul said, because of the fault within the old covenant. The old covenant had fault. Oh, what was the fault in the old covenant? Was it God just not sharp enough to figure it out? No. The, the fault of the old covenant had to do with the blood of the innocent animals. It did not have the efficacy. It didn't have the power. It didn't have the ability to do what God was wanting to do. Are you with me? So compound that exponentially with a, a soul, a carnal soul, that has had and will not have any purging power because of the innocent blood of the animals. That's, that was the weakness of the old covenant. Paul is making a point here. Compound it with since you, the blood doesn't reach to the purging of the heart, then what's going to happen? It's going to fail. I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but I hope you understand what I'm saying there. Therefore, the higher purposes of God were never intended to, nor going to be achieved by the old covenant of blood atonement and the Mosaic covenant. Never was going to happen, never will happen not without the Messiah, not without Christ in it. Because the power of the blood in the old covenant wasn't strong enough. Not because we're better or smarter than anything. It's, it, it has, you know, our, our accepting of what God has offered us is not really that meritous of us. I mean, it, it speaks to God's ability of uh, his persuading powers more than it does to our in, uh, inherent abilities. Are you with me? <laughs> because you're born again, it didn't, it didn't come about because of any power of your own, intellectually or any other way, spiritually. Or, it's because it speaks to God's persuading power. He's, he's good at persuading. He's good at putting you in a circumstance where you'll listen and then he persuades Am I making any sense to anybody out there? It's okay to go like this every once in a while, even if you don't mean it. It just helps me a lot. <laughs> I'm telling you, it, never meant, it was never meant to. It was a stopgap measure until he to whom the promises were made came which was Christ. Although ineffective in that regard to draw the conclusion that Paul was saying there was no power in the eternal purpose in the blood of innocent animals would be scripturally untrue. The blood of goats and bulls offered contingent, offered contingent upon God's assessment of the officer's intent have a sanctifying effect for the flesh. That allows or justifies an approaching or drawing nigh to the covenant God. This blood covenant has kept the nation of Israel. It separated them kept them apart, and it's also brought them under judgment. It not only separated and protected them, kept them, it also separated them under judgment. But the separating them under judgment was a good for us and not unjust of God. Isn't that wonderful that he can balance that? I mean, how can he balance long-suffering and mercy with justice and judgment? How did he do that? He does. That allows or justifies an approaching or drawing nigh of the covenant, keeping God. This blood covenant has kept the nation of Israel separated from part and unto the holy judgments of God, and along with all the law, has pointed them towards the need of the Messiah. <clears throat> There's nothing in the word, 
in the Old Covenant, they didn't point them toward the Messiah. And we find that in Galatians chapter 3 if you want to go look at it. What Paul, or the author of Hebrews, is saying in strong language of contrast in the book of Hebrews is intended to bring the Jewish believer of Christ into an understanding the transition from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant by contrasting the power, the ability to produce a desired or intended result of those two blood sacrifices. I hate hurrying like this, but I absolutely want to get to the point where I want to get. And if I don't hurry, I'm not going to get there, but I can't go over there without saying this. Because you're going to say, what is he talking about? You might say that anyway, but you have a better chance of understanding if I go through this stuff. Bear with me and try to glean and follow what I'm saying. What? Well, well, what does it matter, huh? What does it matter? It matter to us of the new covenant anyway. It, you know, that's kind of what we've, as Christians, approach this subject. Either we have no understanding or no teaching, or we really don't care. And that's the way most Christendom teachers, theologians, approach these subjects, is it just doesn't matter. And... It, 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 it couldn't matter more. I, don't, I hate the question. What does it matter? Isn't the point that under the old covenant blood, we could not be forgiven for our sins? No, that's not true. They were forgiven for their sins, but the blood was not effectual for the purging of the penetrating of the root cause of sin, the sin nature. That is what the promise of the fulfillment of the covenant in Jeremiah was getting to. The writing of his nature upon the heart is synonymous with dealing with the sin nature. The innocent blood of animals only dealt with sin. And only Christ's blood dealt with the propitiation. You know, you know propitiation, right? That's the price for God's holiness and justice that would allow for such a promise to be fulfilled. It's only one only thing. The promise, in effect, is eternal life. What is salvation? Are you saved? That's the question that we hear a lot. Well, what is saved? Well, salvation is eternal life. With all capitals, L-I-F-E. It's not like... Life is in me having consciousness and looking at the clouds. That's not life. Life is a force. I come that you might have life and life. It's a force. Eternal life is a force from God. It's what's in you now. I mean, it's, it's, it's the part that they can't figure out when they get down to the very bottom. <laughs> what is this? That's what I'm talking about, eternal life. That, that's what salvation is about. You're going to live forever. You're going to live forever. Get it in your head right now. You're going to live forever. You're never going to die. And you're not going to sleep. You'd like to sleep, but you ain't going to sleep. Your spirit and soul don't sleep. Just get that out of your head, and I'll well, go to scriptures, and maybe I'll get there. I got it, but I don't know if I'll ever get there. But you're not going to sleep, brothers and sisters. You're not going to sleep. I could give you 30 scriptures and will. You're conscious. You're going to be awake. You're going to live forever, but you may not have eternal life. God is not going to empower that that's not of him. I just put it down, down to the very bottom. God's not going to empower that that's not a part of him. But he's not going to destroy it. It's going to live. It's going to serve a purpose. God doesn't do superfluous things. He doesn't do things in vain. He didn't create you to just throw you back to nothing. He will never do that. You'll serve a purpose. You'll live, but you may not have eternal life. But you'll have a purpose if it's only for others to walk by Isaiah chapter 66 and see what's happening to you. If that's for only purpose, which is a great purpose, by the way. Are we now who are alive, called out by the new covenant blood of Christ? 
Are we now who are alive called out by the new covenant blood of Christ guaranteed our personal salvation? Salvation, as used by modern-day Christian teachers, is a misnomer. The wrong or the inaccurate use of a name or term. They have portrayed obtaining salvation as synonymous with believing in Jesus Christ. Salvation is not automatic with the believing in Christ's blood sacrifice. It's not automatic. Salvation life is about effective, ongoing application of the promised atonement blood, which can only be done through continual faithfulness, motivated or energized by love for God, increasingly through Konania fellowship and through the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. You want to know what those scriptures are? Well, energizing love for God is uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. Increasing through Konania fellowship is John 1. And through the enabling power of the Holy Spirit, I've given you two of those already. Salvation has always been about Christ and his atonement before the foundation of the world. The blood of the old covenant was effective in its limited purpose, and those who mixed it with faith were covered from their sins and upon death experienced rest or peace in Abraham's bosom as a result. Did you get that? The innocent blood of animals didn't go for naught. It never goes, well, that poor animal. The animal, the animal couldn't have served a better purpose. Its death could not, he's going to die. His death could not have served a better purpose than to sanctify for the remission of sins for a believer in Yahweh. It couldn't have happened. I, I'm going to tell you, they would, lambs would have lined up for that privilege. It, is, it did serve a purpose. They were, you, that blood did effectively work mixed with faith. It didn't work just because they shed the blood. It had to be mixed with faith, which is ascertained by God Almighty, not by you or me. We don't, we don't know. God knows. We thought, well, that guy surely went. Well, that guy surely, well, we don't know nothing. God knows. Salvation is just not automatic with believing in the Christ's blood sacrifice. It has to be mixed. Salvation has always been about Christ and his atonement before the foundation. I say before, I underline before, because there's things before the foundation of the earth and there's things that were at the foundation of the earth. The blood of the old covenant was effective in its limited purpose and those who mixed it with faith were covered from their sins and upon death experienced rest or peace in Abraham's bosom as a result. This was a limited form of salvation life. It was salvation for Abraham's seed and circumcision and blood of animals were atonement for those who were in covenant until such time when the promised Messiah who would provide for necessary deeper work comes. They were in Abraham's bosom. They were live, alive, weren't they? They weren't dead. From the garden, from the garden, blood was chosen to be the judgment atonement from God's curse. I'm glad God just made an atonement, aren't you? What if God hadn't made an atonement for the sin? We would have died in our sins, wouldn't we have not? And if we'd have died in our sins, we would not be the inheritors of eternal life. That would not be good. Thank God that he is wise enough to figure out a propitiation price that would allow him to restore us in any kind of condition. Even if that condition falls way short of a complete redemption and reconciliation with him, it's far better to be in Abraham's bosom than it is to be in the place of torment. Right? I'm grateful. Praise God. Was he obligated to do it? I don't know by whom would he have been obligated, only unto himself if he was. Whose curse was it? The devil's? Devil curses? God cursed us. There's a lot of, I find, I can't, I can't, I find, I'm amazed. How is it that people can believe that the curse is from anybody but God? The curse is from God. And although the blood of the animals originally slew by God in the garden to cover the sin of Adam and Eve, even pointed towards the blood of Christ's atonement, that innocent animal blood mixed with Adam, Adam's remorseful repentance, where art thou? I am here, I was ashamed, was restitution enough to restore by regeneration of his spirit. 
Adam back into a partial relationship and fellowship that was not perfect, but far superior to the condition they found themselves in. That condition that was irre irreconcilable in that sin personified that of the serpents or Satans to whom they fell prey and in a condition rejected for heavenly abode or fellowship with God. God stopped coming down every day in the cool of the evening. The Jewish believer experienced that same Adamic partial redemption when he mixed faith with the innocent blood sacrifice of the Old Covenant, Leviticus 16.31. I could read it because I have it here, but I'm going to skip it. Leviticus, I, I suggest you go read Leviticus 16.31 in, in application, but even more than that, Deuteronomy 29.19 says, And it come to pass, when he heareth the words of his curse, whoever it was, any Israelite that was being read this curse, and it comes to pass when he hears the words of this curse that he blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of mine heart to add drunkenness to his thirst. The Lord will not spare him, but then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. And all the curses that are written in the book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot out his name from under the heavens. If you want to know what the world that meant, it meant if you critically appraise God and believe that he, no one will know and no one will care and I'll get away, I'm in covenant, and I, I'm just like my mom and my dad and my sister and my brother, I go to church, ah, I can live in my whatever and get away with it. The Jewish faithful believer did not die in his sin. The Jewish faithful believer did not die in his sin. If he had received God's imputed righteousness, if he had, and he had. God imputed righteousness in the Old Covenant. That imputed righteousness declaration afforded through faith in the blood of the Old Covenant, what did this mean upon death? It meant he would go to the place of rest. That's Abraham's bosom, the place separated from the tormenting hell by a wide abyss. That's a real place. I'm telling you, it's so real that any moment we'll, we, can, we can experience it. All we have to do is leave here. We're just, we're just the thickness of our skin away from seeing that in reality. God could take scales off our eyes right now. We could see it. I tell you, it would literally scare us to our face. Just his presence will scare us to our face. If he showed us what was going on, and I read the scriptures, it's in uh, Luke 16, 19 through 31, that's that whole story of Lazarus and the rich man. It's a wonderful story, a lot of insight there. That's the waiting place of the dead. Dead meaning had died, that is the physical bodies, but the spirit and the souls live awaiting the promise of the salvation life unto the reconciliation, which is a total, that's, um, reconciliation is the th reconciled back with God as we were, if not better. That's what I mean by reconciliation. I'm not talking about we go, you know, we, we, get, we get on some kind of terms with God where it, we don't know him really, we don't see him, we can't, but, you know, it's okay. We're not going to hell. That's not reconciliation. Reconciliation is, is as the new covenant for the Gentiles speaks is a new creation. All right, what is that? Reconciliation would be back to something as good as Adam and Eve had in the garden. That's the low bar. That's not the place to, to which God has called us. Praise his holy name and his wisdom. In his wisdom, he's able to call us beyond where Adam and Eve were, in that of a new creation. Sons of God, joint heirs with God. I'm telling you, rule and reign. He's called some to be there and do that. I'd, I'd love to be there. It ain't just going to happen because he drew my name out of, of a hat. You know, I, it, but brothers and sisters, you got to pant, you got to work, you got to want, you got to dig, you got to fight. It's worth it. We're talking about ruling and reigning. We're talking about a new creation. We're talking about being in the presence of God, like, and beyond where Adam was. Praise God. Praise God. God opened our brains and our hearts. You know, we're in a stupor. We're just like those Old Testament covenant. Scribes and Pharisees that Jesus Christ said, You're, you don't understand. You say you understand, but you have no clue. Because you think you understand, you don't understand. If you didn't understand, knew you didn't understand, then you'd understand. 
Well, we don't know that we don't understand. We're sitting here, Maggie, yeah, that's right, amen, brother. But we have no clue. No more amens from this week, then. I'm just speaking. Not, not, not specifically to this group. I'm just saying as a church, as the Christendom, they say, amen. I know the exact feeling, experiencing it myself. Which is a total reconciliation with God that will be accomplished in Christ with his victorious life, his death, his resurrection, his glorification. He preached that. He preached that this accomplishment to those that were in waiting by that certain kind of justified in death. What is he to say in there? I'm saying Christ went to the place of the dead and preached in the gospel according to Peter, according to Paul. I believe it. I believe that he went there, he preached. And I believe he, sh he shared <laughs> his salvation plan with them. And, and to whatever degree that they could appropriate that atonement from Abraham's bosom, I'm telling you, there was a resounding amen. Yahoo, <laughs> hallelujah. I mean, they were jumping up and down. Brothers and sisters, that was a triumph. When he was pulled out of the grave, it was such a triumph. <laughs> hallelujah, <laughs> hallelujah. Somehow I believe we're going to get to experience these things, even though we live in such a little small capsule of time. God help us. All the other free, that, that animal and blood had redemptive power, but not enough to afford a total restoration back into the pre-fall communion of the garden. You can see why it's just a perfect type. Why was this Abraham's bosom? Well, there was Abraham's bosom because they couldn't get, Adam couldn't get back in the garden. Had Adam and Eve been able to get back in the garden, that would have shown the full restoration and reconciliation that the blood of the animals was able to pay the propitiation price for God's justice and holiness. But because the Adam and Eve couldn't be restored back into the fellowship that they were in, and God actually set a guard at the gate of the garden, that is reflective of when they died, they couldn't go into the presence of God. You see? It's a type. The Adam and Eve... And, uh, and the uh, Abraham's bosom are synonymous. One's in living while they're in this body. One is when they're out of the body. But both are in a place separated from God. But yet in a better place than they would have been had they died in their sins. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. He's, he's wise. He's so wise. That limited power of the early covenant blood can be seen in the clear type and reflected in Adam's partial re restoration, not back into the fullness of the garden fellowship. That is because that blood would not completely fulfill the propitiation God required. Establishing the eternal truth, the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit cannot be fully appropriated to the essential depth of purging the human fallen nature, the fallen character man, in order to restore him completely to that fellowship he had in the garden as he was yet barred from it, much less to that nature and much less to that fellowship he had in the garden as he was barred from it, much less to that nature afforded in the atonement gift of the power of the Holy Spirit now available unto a new creation. Revealing the truth. You guys have meditate some on this. You know, that's why I give you the notes. Revealing the truth that that sacrificial blood of for, blood forgiving covenant would not afford him after death that fullness of fellowship that once close communion with God by allowing him back into his manifest presence in heaven either. I already told you that. I, I, I did it better when I was just speaking it rather than reading it. <laughs> I understood it better myself. <laughs> God provided this innocent animal blood atonement, of, albeit it fell short, it had redemptive cleansing power. Thus the need and the place for rest, Abraham's bosom, the place of the righteous living dead. The existence of Abraham's bosom is testimony of the merciful and loving kindness of God extended by our covenant, keeping God in addition to the sure evidence of his righteousness and holy justice. It's sure evidence. This additionally exposing the need of a deeper work. This exposes the need of a deeper work. This Adam and Eve, Abraham's bosom, all that stuff exposes the need for a deeper work. Hey, I want back into fellowship with you. I'm sorry. Well, if I can't, I'm just going to kill myself. 
You don't have to kill yourself. I'll kill myself. God provided this atonement, animal blood, atonement, I'll be a false short, blah, blah. Is that where I was, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. The work afforded by the atonement with the blood sacrifice, that's the deeper work. The work afforded by the, capital T, the atonement, capital A, with his blood sacrifice, capital B. Prophetic old covenant promises would have been fulfilled had Israel received Yeshua as their Christ and presumably would have ushered in the millennium reign. All right, I just finished the review of last week's lesson. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I don't care. You know, I know I got a place up, you know, in the Colorado, and if you don't take a weed eater, you don't get the weeds yet. And if you were going to do it by hand, You'd have to walk up and down that hill about a thousand times, you know, to get that path figured out. I mean, to get the discernment of the path, where it just was no effort, and you knew exactly where you could see it, you had to tread on it, and tread on it, tread on it. To tie the truth of Scripture of both a rebuilt temple in the millennium with its blood sacrifices and Christ's body of believers married to him. Mostly I'll be speaking there about Ezekiel the last seven or eight ch chapters. I'm talking about the millennium with its blood sacrifices and Christ's body of believers married to him and ruling with him in that mysterious kingdom made up of Jews and Gentiles that Paul spoke of in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Go there, Ephesians 3, 1. I may not read another scripture. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 11, I think. 1. 3 1. I'm talking about this uh, mysterious uh, body of Christ called out of the Gentiles. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. In other words, you couldn't find it in the Old Covenant. You couldn't find what God did in the Old Covenant because it was a mystery. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. That the Gentiles would be called and God would turn to the Gentiles was no secret. It was no mystery. That's all over the Old Covenant. But Paul speaks of a different thing here that was not in clearly discernible, which is the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the calling out of the Gentile in the form and fashion that God did it in such a manner that it would even make them jealous. Wherefore, I was made a minister. Wherefore, I was made a minister of that, well, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is the grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which was from the beginning of the world hath been hidden in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers and the heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have to differentiate between the covenants and their kingdoms. For this, that the Gentiles were to be saved was no mystery. Romans 9, 23 and 26 says that. And that they might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had before prepared unto glory, even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. I'm reading Romans 9, 23 through 26. Verse 25 says, And he saith also in Hosea, 
I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which were not my beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, you are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. See, Hosea has seen that, that, that there'd be this uh, turning or calling of the Gentiles, but they had no clue as to the extent as ha- this, this marvelous plan of God for to call out a bride out of the Gentiles. He, he didn't, Hosea didn't see that. You know, they, they had something in their mind that had to do down the same lines that they were on. Well, they'll be, he, he's got us at the point, but he's going to call some Gentiles in. I'm trying to establish here that you have to see the difference between the kingdoms and the covenants, all right? The old covenant I'm trying to define for you and contrast the bloods. By contrasting the bloods, I'm contrasting the covenants. And the kingdoms, I'm going to get there, God willing. Are you getting anything out of this? I mean, I understand it's, there's a lot of anal stuff in here, but, but yet I'm telling you the heart in here of God pulsates as if I can touch it or if I can find it here. The mystery is that God began forming an entirely new thing called the church, ecclesia, which means called out. The Israelites were Ecclesia from other from the other nations. But James said in Acts 15, 14, and 17, chapter 15, verse 14 and 17, this is what James said. When you remember there was a, a, no a great dispute, you know, a great dispute among uh, the disciples and the churches. How, what we, the Gentiles are coming in, they're not paying any attention to Moses. What are we going to do? Oh, no. What are we going to do? And there, James stood up and said, Simon, Peter, hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles. You remember, he, he had the vision on the roof and the whole deal. To take out of them a people for his name, that God was calling out a people from among the Gentiles, a people called by his name, two different callings. And you go uh, back and you look to the, Old Covenant, you find that as a quote from the Old Covenant and what was understood by James that seemed to quiet the whole scene. There was, it says, a great dispute. This scripture quote that James pulled out of the Old Covenant was enough to quiet them all and satisfy them. God has chosen to call out a people after his name a people for his name. Now, what we are in this dispensation of the Gentiles, if you want to call it that, I know some people don't like the word dispensation, this time of the Gentiles, that's the way it's referred to in the Bible. What what we have is a time that God has turned from the nation of Israel to the Gentiles, and out of the Gentiles, he is called a body, a bride, that he is called for his name, whatever that means. Believe you me, it meant more to those Hebrews that day in Acts chapter 15 than it does to us. But it was enough to suffice. The purpose then for the dispensation we find ourselves in is primarily about God calling out or gathering of the body of people of the church, capital C. Thought to also be with Christ and ruling with him during the millennium period. That's the way it's taught by 90% of theologians. The body or church is a living heavenly organism, kingdom, called out of Gentiles as opposed to the national Israel kingdom calling. Two different callings. God turned his back on the Israelites and he called unto the Gentiles to call a people out for his name. Two different callings. There's still two callings. The body or church is a living heavenly organism kingdom calling out of Gentiles as opposed to a national Israel kingdom calling. Christ is the head and the cornerstone, and Christ's called out ones make up the rest of the heavenly structure of the body. I'm going to get in here and talk to you about those two kingdoms if I can get here. 
The Israelites or Jews of yesterday or today are another distinct part of the body of believers called out. They are descendants of Abraham from a physical lineage. And although either of these two branches can include both Jews and Gentiles, there is a clear distinction within Scripture that defines the uniqueness of these two parts of one body. One body of people. In the end, it's one body of people. Made up almost entirely of Gentiles, a branch to reflect the head that is Christ's personality, and one body that could not have existed until after his youth after his death and resurrection, so could not have been before. And that had that uniqueness, it had that uniqueness we have been speaking of, which is that of the infilling or the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit as its hallmark. That's one calling. The other, the personality of Abraham, the father of the Jews. Two callings, two peoples, two organisms, two branches. Are you with me? That's in the earth today. The organism of the body, the bride of Christ, is called to reflect and be the personality of Christ through loving faith. When he led captivity captive, the very next verse says, and he gave gifts unto man. He gave gifts, apostles, evangelists, teachers, prophets, pastors, for the perfecting, the maturing of the saints. For what purpose? Until they come into the very image of Christ, the head. You see this? Do you see that? It's, the, it's for the purpose of of becoming Christ-like for that God would call out a people that were Christ-like for his name. That's the calling to the Gentiles. That's the purpose. That's something exceedingly envious. Would be if you had a Jew looking at it with wide open eyes, seeing his Abrahamic heritage, all the promise that God gave him on one hand and then saying, I don't receive the Messiah and then looking over here and seeing the result of God turning his back upon you who has rejected Christ and looking to what God did for, for the Gentile. It, it, it has exceeding value. Though we have had possession of it for so long that we, it's lost its value to us. Christ being both the head and the bridegroom is found in type in Adam who was both the body and the bridegroom. And in Eve who was both the body and the bride. The bride of Christ being represented here as a virgin wife, differing from the nation of Israel who will be taken back as depicted as a wayward wife. At that time of restoration of the nation of Israel, Scripture says Satan will be bound and the wicked nations removed. See Revelations 19.21 with Christ's parable of the sheep and the goat nations. Matthew 25 says, when, 31, 25, 31 says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from goats, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left. And the rest of that parable is pornographic. The point is to try scripturally reconcile this seemingly contradictive understanding of a branch of people that were not the people of God. Called to perfection through Christ the head and his body, which are living stones and are built upon Christ as the cornerstone, as a holy habitation unto God, 1 Peter 2. And how does this body fit time-wise and purpose-wise with God's declared other eternal body of perfected believers living in time? the future millennial Israelites who have this lineage, this heritage, this third temple described by Ezekiel with its future observations and observances of feasts and ritual sacrifices that previously were filled with meaning by Christ? Will you tell me? The Word of God says that, that these things were shadows. They were figures of the true, Hebrews 9.24. But then in Ezekiel 44, 4, it says, Behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. He validates. He, he, he sends his spirit, his Shekinah glory, and fills the temple. How are these truths reconciled? Simply said, it is the fulfilling of the promises to Israel that could have been potentially accomplished 2,000 years ago had the nations of Israel accepted Yeshua as their Christ Messiah and with his prophesied acceptance by the nation of Israel upon his second revealing 
for the following next 1,000 years, those will experience on earth what the nation of Israel would have done thousands of years ago. The age of that millennium will possibly be known as the age of righteousness. The book of Hebrews is as opposed to the age of the divine influence of, upon the heart by the Holy Spirit. The book of Hebrews is the explanation to the Jews of the transition from the Old Testament to the New. But where is the understanding found from the New Testament to the millennial reign of Christ that includes Ezekiel's temple with its ritual? God having fulfilled the old covenant as it was faulty, Hebrews 8, 7, and had destroyed the temple and its observances, how is it in the millennial period does he restore some of those previous practices that were shadows? The blood of the Old Testament was animal blood and was used for the sanctifying or cleansing the copies of the heavenly temple, according to the new covenant scripture and according to old covenant scripture. But the heavenly temple could not be sanctified or cleansed by the blood of bulls and goats, but only by the blood of Christ, according to Paul in Hebrews or whoever wrote the book. Thus it is presumed when the third temple is built, the blood of animals will once again be employed to cleanse the earthly type for the heavenly real. Ezekiel 43, 18 through 20. I would read the scripture, but don't have time. We who are in Christ know the significance of observing the feasts and those times of God as object lessons. But what purpose if Christ is in Jerusalem or ruling, reigning, physically manifesting himself there? Certainly the temple will be rebuilt. Certainly there will be blood sacrifices. When and for what purpose is one of the major questions here. Scripture seems to clearly bear out that the temple of Ezekiel will be there in the millennium. The two kingdom bodies, there's two kingdoms, there's two bodies, there's two entities are simultaneously existing at the same time. One possibly in the heavenly realm, that of the body of Christ judged worthy at his second coming. Ruling and reigning with him. Very possibly similar to what the Hebrews, or what the book of Hebrews chapter 1 says about the ministering angels. Where he said that the ministering angels are flames of fire, ministers of fire. Are they not and are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? I doubt very seriously if anybody understood what I just said, so I better stop a second. Uh, you got it? Praise the Lord. What I basically just proposed to you is pretty far out, what I was writing. Nothing to do about that, I guess. Not intent, intent to be that way. Just proposing. I know nothing in me will allow me to believe that there will be a mixing of spiritual people and living physical people on this earth at the same time. And what I propose to you is that those who will sit at this judgment seat of Christ that are found worthy to be part of the first resurrection, who then will reign and rule with Christ in such a manner above the earth in a heavenly sphere in such a manner possibly as the angels that are in heaven do in this day and time of the Gentiles. That's what I'm saying there. Just, to, just for food for thought because I believe it's two spheres in one. Two, two simultaneous spheres. And if I had, can take a few more minutes, maybe I'll get there. This, this describes as how the angels of God are ministers of those who will be heirs, and that, is, and that is today. Out of sight in the spiritual realm, all the while another body, that of Abraham's seed, the nation of Israel, all the tribes, fulfill the destiny God promised to the end purpose that they are chosen people to represent God in the earth to all the sheep, nation, all the sheep nations. Because the devil will be bound. We read that scripture earlier. And... Not only the devil moved down, but the God will, Christ at his throne will separate the sheep and the goat nations, also casting those goat nations, uh, yeah, also along with Satan. The devil will set free once again at the end of that thousand year period to tempt and try the inhabitants of the earth, and specifically God's chosen people are inhabiting and evangelizing the earth. The return of Christ is the establishing of the kingdoms. I'm talking about the second coming of Christ. Jacob's trouble, the tribulation, ushers in the acceptance of Yeshua as Israel's Messiah. So we have these two 
dynamics going on right now. And I, I should draw a picture. For at the time that Christ was rejected by the nation of Israel, that's the start of the beginning of the time of the Gentiles, up to the point that the Messiah returns. He returns and they see him. Whether they see him physically or spiritually, they see him, the Israelites, the Jews that are on the earth at that time, and they mourn and they repent. That's the end of the time of the Gentiles. There's the span that which we live in, and I think that the, the pouring out of Joel chapter 2, which had to do with the Spirit of God, the first rain, the former rain, had to do with the time of the Gentiles beginning in Acts. At the end of the time of the Gentiles is the pouring out of the second pouring out, the latter day reign of the Holy Spirit. That, so we're approaching the end of the time of the Gentiles. But not only are we approaching the end of the time of the Gentiles, we're approaching the beginning of the time of the Jews, the Israelites. So the spirit that was working back at the beginning, I'm going to have to just speak uh, extemporaneously because there's no way. I only got a few minutes. So the, the spirit that Paul alludes to in Thessalonians that was there amongst them at the time, this spirit uh, of Antichrist was working at that time, he said. But not only was it working at that time, it didn't mean that, the, that Christendom was going to fail at that time. It didn't mean that just as soon as it got birthed, it was going to die. But it meant that that spirit of Antichrist was already working. And the power of the Spirit of God was he that restraineth the spirit of Antichrist. The reason he restrains it is because he's calling out of the Gentiles. He's already judged the Israelite and turned his back on him and destroyed the nation in A.D. 70 and then again in 130, 134. He destroyed the nation of Israel, the temple. He dispersed all his life. And in the meantime, he's, he's judging them, but he's turned his mercy toward the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are receptive to the Spirit of God. So in the beginning, the Gentiles were receptive unto God, and they were just uh, growing, growing, growing. But now toward the end of the time of the Gentiles, the reason it's becoming the end is because the Gentiles are turning their back on God. Just as the Israelites turned their back on God and God turned his back on them. So when God's turning his back on the, uh, on the uh, Gentiles because their refusal to accept him, in Thessalonians it says God sent a strong delusion because they hated the light. And that strong delusion is now taking effect. And what's happening is, is God's turning again to Israel. <laughs> oh, the wisdom of God. So the Israelites are going to be awakened unto Christ as the Gentiles, the uh, time of the Gentiles is closing. And I believe we're right at the throes. Whatever that is, however many years, I don't know. But I'm suggesting to you that, that that's where we're at. And this, this, this dynamic that I'm speaking of to you is about these two kingdoms and an understanding. And uh, what time do we have to be out of here? Four. Okay. Will you allow me to keep moving? I, I want to talk to you about this. Time. This is really important. And I know you've been sitting there, and you're tired of sitting there, but you go home and you lay down and take a nap. <laughs> In the second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall come. What day? The day of the second coming of Christ. It shall not come except there come a falling away first. Wasn't this speak of... Uh, Matthew chapter 24, that in the latter days that, that the hearts of many will turn cold. It's the same thing Paul's talking about. There's a gum of falling away. First, what? It's the coldness, the coldness that falls into the church of the Gentile. Little c. Christendom. Believers, but not knowers. I get there. And because of iniquity shall abound. 
What precedes Christ's return is the falling away. That same falling away Christ warned of in Matthew 24, and because of iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. I didn't know I wrote it. Iniquity began to work in the days of the apostles in the church, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. But so as not to believe that Christianity had, been, had failed when hardly started, Paul said, don't be deceived, disheartened by any means, for that day shall not come. He's encouraging me. That day is not going to be here tomorrow. That day shall not come. That although there is a working of iniquity already that is causing a falling away by the spirit of deceivableness that some were so inherently prone to follow was just beginning. And that deceivableness was being restrained and that by mercy and loving kindness, gradually, the mercy and loving kindness was shown toward the Gentile, not because they deserved it, but because God had turned the covenant from the Israelites. Remember Romans chapter 11? We were the recipients of something that we totally undeserved. We were people without a God. We didn't care about God. And we shouldn't get in our head that we deserve anything or God, was, God just loved us because so much. He turned to us because the Israelites refused, but he, he hardened their hearts so that, that he could turn to us. All right? So he's saying that gradually, this mercy and loving kindness that he showed us was the severity, the other side of the severity that he showed them, it gradually... That restraining power of that spirit of Antichrist will be removed and replaced by justice and judgment being less and less warranted. See, God's loving kindness and mercy is less and less warranted by the Gentiles because their time is ending, because their hearts are waning, they're, they're, they're becoming cold, because they receive not. I'm telling you today, the, the indictment against the Gentiles is they receive not the love of truth that they might be saved. They refuse. They don't want the truth. We want to live in our materialism. We want to have what we have. We want to get all we can. That's why that this spirit is coming upon the Gentiles and it's coming on us in a hurry. If I don't get rocks thrown at me, I, I, I'll tell you what happens there's a dull look out of everybody's eyes and they haven't got a clue what I'm talking about anyway. They're either in a stupor or they're angry. One or the other. They, only a few receive a, a message that is this calls for such uh, responsibility, accountability, account, uh, for you to wake up, slap yourself. It, it calls for that. And most people don't want to... And the Gentiles are just now been just overburdened with blah, 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 blah. And so they're just dull of hearing. And they're wore out. Kids say, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go to that church. I don't want to do that. Well, you can blame them. Huh? I can't. They see clearer than we do. They see hypocrisy better than we do. Because we become religiously minded, we're blinded to the hypocrisy. And the kids aren't religiously minded, so they're not blinded. So you wonder how they see the hypocrisy and you don't. And then you try to talk them out of it and try to explain it to them. Well, it's not really, no one's perfect, and blah, blah, blah. Well, the kids are all black and white. You, don't, you can't preach the middle and call that not hypocrisy to a child. They got a better mind and a better understanding, more wisdom of God than you got. Are you with me on that? Sorry, that's free of charge. Didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> Gradually, that restraining power removed and replaced by justice and judgment being less and less warranted in that because they received not the love of truth, they might be saved. Thessalonians says refusing anything but a cheap gospel of salvation. That's all people want, a cheap gospel of salvation. Just punch my ticket, let me go to heaven. For this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. Does this sound a lot like what God did to the Israelites here? Huh. Better believe it's the shoe's going on the other foot. Just like Paul said, don't, don't, don't think you're standing too, too surely. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he said, these things are types and shadows so that we might learn. But had, they, had, they had no pleasure. They, had, they don't want to believe the truth because they had pleasure in unrighteousness. And he that leadeth or restrained the spirit of grace, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. He's the one that leadeth and is restrained. You're not going to be raptured out of here. You're going to be here. And even if you are, I mean, I don't want to go, okay? Let me go on record. You know why? 
This is going to be the greatest opportunity for true believers to, to preach and to rescue some people right out of the fire. And, and, and the Holy Spirit to stop letting or restraining is no effort for him. He doesn't have to leave here to not restrain evil. I mean, evil is exponentially growing right now, people, right in front of your eyes. Look at the dogma and the doctrine of the church and the media and the government. Those are the three entities you can look at, and they all three of them are bound for hell. The restraining force is off in case you haven't figured it out. And the Holy Spirit didn't have to leave and take you with him to stop it. <laughs> he just stopped restraining it. And he sent a delusion on top of that. That we would believe a lie. Because we love darkness more than light. We don't want to come to the light. We're like a cockroach. We want to hide under the baseboard during the daytime. Well, that's the reality. The spirit of grace in this Gentile calling will no longer restrain. Then the inevitable revealing the mystery of iniquity. It's progressively wicked nature in the world, even unto the full manifestation of the Antichrist spirit and the son of perdition. <laughs> in league and control of the apostate Babylonian whorish church. Believe it or not, that's what we're a part of. And only then after this time of judgment of men's hearts shall be accomplished. This is a judgment. That, the tribulation period is the judgment on our world. And a part of that is this apostate whorish church that calls itself God. It ain't the Catholic Church. It's all of Christendom. Stick them all in there. It ain't just Catholicism. Oh, granted, Catholicism is, is right there big time. But I'm saying just our traditional beliefs have stolen from every denomination. They've stolen away the power of God from the gospel. Because you think you're born again, you think you're going to heaven. I've tried to tell you over and over in Scripture that they had a covenant. They had the regenerating power. Believing is not enough. Believing is not. If the believing was enough, there would be no need for God to tell you to be alert, be awake, watch out, and warn. And wouldn't they need the first chapters of Revelation, would he? Because all those were believers. They just weren't doers. They just weren't knowers. That's all they were. They were merely believers. I'm, if I get it, if I got time, I, I laid it out here for you. I took all of the, the uh, you remember where Christ said uh, the kingdom of heaven is like? And he gave ten examples of the kingdom of heaven. I got them all right here in my notes. You got them. And I'm going to show you how, if you're trusting in the fact that you believe in Jesus Christ, that is not meritous enough for you to go to heaven. <laughs> I know. I say, that's where I usually get a rock. No, no dead looks there. Everybody understood exactly what I said when I said that. Well, it's a reality, people. What do you think a strong delusion is? It's one that thinks that you can live any way you want to and inherit the kingdom of God. If there's not a stronger delusion than that, I don't know what it is. That is as strong as delusion as you're ever going to fall for if you're believing that. You are as darkened as you can get. Because you cannot be and live and do and act and say and reflect the image of the world and expect to inherit the things of God, a throne and a kingdom and a crown and a scepter. You can't expect that. And if you do, that is as deluded as you can be. It's contrary to every word in the entire Bible. God will have to say sorry to Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm sorry. Again, I got into preaching. I want to teach. And only then after the time of judgment, men's hearts will be accomplished. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the tribulation, people. The Antichrist and the Spirit, it's not just the Jews that are going to experience the time of Jacob's trouble. The Antichrist and Spirit, if you're in the earth, you're going to experience. Are you experiencing any tribulation right now? Well, I'm going to tell you what. You have been living in a hole somewhere if you're not. There is... Tribulation has been, and, and you're here in a good place. You ought to be in India. 
or China or Indonesia, Africa. Good gracious people. And we're tribulating. I mean, every, the Bible says everything that can be shook will be shook. It's being shaken right now. In, in each one of our lives. It's either through a mother or a sister or a brother or a friend or at work or a loved one or whatever. It's tribulating. And if you aren't established in these things of God and you haven't laid role to care of this life over on the Lord and taken no care for this world but only the things of God, you're going to be shaking. You're going to shake and you're going to tribulate and you're going to fall down. And you're going to beg God to kill you. The Antichrist and his spirit and all the, this stuff that's coming, the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. We are in the last days. We, are, we have and are progressively experiencing the effects of the lessening and the restraining of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, this is exponential in, in, in the evil. But it is because the, he that restraineth is no longer restraining. You think he's, the, the Holy Spirit is being overcome by the devil? No, the Holy Spirit is no longer restraining. It's kind of like Lot and his wife. And he was warned, don't look back. And his wife looked back. There was a power, a restraining power, that held them in check, held the power of God in check until they escaped. There is a time of the Gentiles, and there is a, to the last person God knows. And when that person's out of the city, buddy, this is, this is you can hang it up. He that restraineth will no longer restrain at all. I don't, I'm not trying to scare or be, I frighten you. I'm just trying to bring reality into where we're living and, and the truth of the Word of God. It's, I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be controversial. I'm trying to awaken us unto righteousness and let the Spirit, Holy Spirit of God create in us the likeness of Christ so we can be a part of the first resurrection, a part of the body of Christ, be, a, be a, found to be overcomers, not because we're so perfect, but because He's ascertained us as a heart that is panting after Him. He ascertained it. He looked and He said, that man's heart is for me. He wants to serve me. He wants to please me. He's making moves toward me. Look at Him. He gets up. He prays. He seeks me. God knows that stuff, and He looks at our heart. And He's the one that declares someone righteous. Not the church. Not anybody can declare righteous or unrighteous. It's God. He'll look at each one of us on an individual basis and declare our righteousness. And I have nothing to do with what denomination you belong to, or where you went to church, or your mom and dad, or anything else. It'll have only to do with you. We are in the last days. We're in the latter part of the early rain. We, have, we are in the dry, hot summer wilderness after the Pentecostal experience. Before the autumn and the great day of atonement and before the millennium tabernacles, we're right there. After the rejection of Christ by Israel, God did not intend to evangelize the world. That's another thing that the church has gotten wrong. God did not intend to evangelize the world through the church the body of Christ, but to call out a bride from the Gentiles. The Great Commission of Matthew 28 was about a bride out of the Gentiles not designed to overthrow the world system and establish Christ's kingdom in the earth. Wasn't intended, won't ever, isn't going to happen. Don't look for a revival that saves the world. It ain't going to happen. Never was intended to be that way. This tribulation is God's way of dealing with this earth and the world and the Antichrist and the Spirit. He's got it figured out. But what we're about right now and what he's about is we're trying to help him call the last remnants of the Gentiles out of the world that are meant for a body for his name. But after Israel rejected the Messiah, the days of Daniel's prophecy were suspended. What days of Daniel's prophecy am I talking about? I'm talking about the seventh week of the 70th weeks. 70 weeks of Daniel. I'm talking about that one is suspended. It all fits perfectly. Then all of a stop, so after the Messiah. <laughs> and now suspended in time is this one little week of seven years. 
That seven-year period is Daniel's prophecy. Every Bible scholar, every prophetic teacher will tell you about Daniel's 70 week because it's true. There is a 70th week that will be played out. It hadn't been played out, and it will play out. And it's suspended. And, we're, I, and I, am in, I am, my heart says we're right there at that. Not that I am anything. But after Israel rejected the Messiah, the days of Daniel's prophecy were suspended, and he shall now make Israel jealous by going to the Gentiles to call out a bride of people that were not a people. I am jealous over you with a guilty, with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. We are depicted there as espoused to a husband. A chaste virgin. I got three minutes. But in these last days, as the hearts of the Gentiles turn away and anti-Semitism increases, the focus of God will begin to look away towards Israel and the ancient covenants as it was and will be. To set up his messianic kingdom on earth and through his chosen people, the nation of Israel, taking his preferred status to show forth the wonders of God to the other nations. That's going to be fulfilled. He will ultimately evangelize the nations but through the nation of Israel, as he has always promised. And that time will be during the millennium period when the word of righteousness will be unhindered as foretold in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 4, Ezekiel 36, 21, 38, Ezekiel 37. Note, Isaiah prophecies have most to do with the Messiah and Israel. Jeremiah is the prophet of Israel's return to their own land. Ezekiel has more to do with the restoration of Israel to their own land and with the millennial land restored temple in the form of worship in that millennial time. Daniel was the prophet foretold of the Gentiles and the Antichrist. Zechariah is directed to speak mostly concerning the events that shall happen at the second coming of the Messiah, the uh, Christ, it, it, like Armageddon, Israel's conversion, Christ's return to the mount, aging, keeping feast of tabernacles. All those are found in Zechariah. Many of these things are sealed up yet. An enigma, hard to understand and reconcile. But one thing is very clear from Scripture at the end of the millennial period, which is the end of the book of Revelation, which is the end of the Bible, which reflects the end of the salvation plan of God, all of it. Revelation 20 says the result of all this, all this salvation plan of God, the fullness, the completion of God's salvation plan culminates after the millennium and after the great white throne judgment in the first verse of Revelation 21. We see a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth are passed away. And it says in the very end, And I, John, saw the body. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. So don't get all hung up on that temple, Ezekiel's temple. Don't get all hung up on it because the end result is that there is no temple. And the end result is God is in the Lamb or the temple. So I don't care. We can focus down enough so we can have a somewhat of an understanding. But in reality, it, there will be no physical temple. And although there should be no question as to the physical temple or sacrifices at this time as they done away with, but yet there are gates by which the nations presumably of the earth shall find no difficulty in finding their way and will enter bringing glory and honor into it. What that glory and honor consists of specifically, the Bible does not say. But in that day, that day when the earth is renewed, redone, well, new heaven, new earth, renewed, then they will, it says, the nations will bring in glory. Praise the Lord. Now, I got really to the meat of what I wanted to talk about. You know, that's all. <laughs> that's page 14. Well, my 14, I don't know what page it is. What page am I on? Another deep? Yeah. Well... If the Lord wills, uh, I'll finish it next week if I, if I don't. I didn't want to do it this week. I didn't want to do what I just did this week uh, because, you know, you know why. There's, there's just difficulties in talking about these subjects where you get people upset. But you know what? I said it earlier. It's not about us, is it? It's about God. And my heart was convicted because somebody 
in the, during the week uh, engaged me in the conversation about what I had taught last week. And, and when during that engagement with me, they, they uh, drew from me. I felt the Spirit of God come on me, and they drew from, he drew from me. And I said a lot of things from my spirit in regard to the things what I'm talking about right now. And I thought, oh boy, God wants me to do that again. Had it been dry, flat, no anointing in me, I would not have uh, broached this subject again. I, was, I fought God about broaching it to begin with, and I'm still fighting him, but it's, a lot has to do with my insecurity and my unsureness of the things that I'm talking about in regard to the millennium period. And so, you know, we all want to be able to teach and not, no, have nobody dispute us. Well, that's not possible. And one of the things I'm saying, I'll be the first to say, about I don't know, a lot of these things are. That's why you have, you know, 400 expositors giving an opinion. You know, there's 500 opinions. So it, it's, you know, you're going to have to use the wisdom of God in what he has revealed and let your heart be your guide in some of these things. There is, the reality is the things I'm speaking of are truths that would have to be dealt with. And you can't tear a page out of the Bible. So, well, that ain't going to happen. You know, it is and it will be, and there's no contradiction in the Word of God. Heavenly Father, thank you for this group. Thank you for their attention. Uh, thank you, Lord. I ask you to give them a special blessing. You know, the only book in the Bible that really has a special blessing in it for keeping and observing is the book of Revelations. And, and that's what we've been speaking a lot about, God. So hey, if it's possible, I would pray this group could get a special blessing from trying to reach into the depths of your truth and apply them to our hearts, to awaken us unto righteousness, to awaken us unto your, your majestic being and, and observe you as we should, to acknowledge you as we serve. We, we ask for a special blessing this day upon us because we, that's our heart's desire. And the blessing of the book of Revelations, let it be upon us, Father. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Who wants to sing it? The Aaronic blessing. Or at least say it. Will Brother Jerry, will you do it for us? Hallelujah. <laughs> shine on you and be gracious unto you and be gracious unto you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom praise God hallelujah Thank you.